Okay. How many of you have made resolutions from for 2022? Nobody. Wow. First time I ask a question at church and nobody has made resolutions. I know you have made resolutions. How many of you have broken those resolutions already? Exactly. This is the prime time for resolutions. Uh, in North America, the United States and Canada, uh, this is the time when gyms get a lot of people, new people in the gyms. You know that? Probably before pandemic, there was more of it, right? And so people that go regularly to a gym, they start seeing new people, you know, like 10, 20 new people. And they're saying, where are they coming from? Uh, these people will be there for a month. February, they're not there. Times of resolutions, but unfortunately, not a lot of people follow up, okay? It's not enough to make resolutions. We need to follow up on resolutions, right? Uh, I was reading a statistic that said that 95% of the people that lose weight, 95% of the people that lose weight, they're not able to keep it. Do you know that? That's not encouraging. 95% of the people that lose weight, they're not able to keep it. Why do you think that is? Because they're, follow, they're following a list of things, right? It's what is called a diet, right? They follow a diet, a list of things. And when you have a list of things... No change takes place. I mean, some change takes place, but they are temporary, right? In order for a, for a change to stick, it needs to come from inside, not from outside. Are you following this? That's why God is interested in transforming your heart. Jesus says, I want to transform your heart it's from inside. Because if changes take place in cha inside, then they are of lasting effect. If we all concentrate on list of things, list of things, this is what I have to do, this is what I have to do, this is what I have to do, this is what I have to do. Those are changes that are taking place from the outside. And so they never remain. Something needs to happen from within. We need to allow Jesus Christ to transform our heart. Isaiah 55, 8 says, My thoughts are not like your thoughts. Your ways are not like my ways. Do you believe that God's plans are better than your plans? Do you believe that? God's plans are way better than our plans. So I don't know what you've been planning for 2022. I'm sure some things have come to your mind, you know. I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to start eating better. I'm going to stop uh, being rude. I'm going to stop raising my voice. I'm going to stop complaining. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It doesn't matter what you're planning. I want to remind you that God's plans are better for you. Why are God's plans better for you? Well, because God can see things you can't. Amen? God can see things that you cannot see. You see, our vision is limited. We can only see certain things. We can only see what is in front of us. Uh, a famous lady died, I think, one, a day ago, two days ago, Betty White. Do you know Betty White? Have you heard of Betty White? Wait, what is this? 2022, nobody's participating? 
Is that, is that something that you purpose? I'm not going to raise my hand in church anymore, 2022. How many of you have heard of Betty White? Let me see. Ah, okay, thank you, thank you. So somebody put on Facebook, a pastor put on Facebook and said, am I the only one that have never heard of Betty White? And then some people start writing and say, no, no, you're not the only one. I've never heard of her. You know, you're not the only one. And then somebody said, oh, don't worry, pastor. You didn't miss anything. She was a vulgar person. Wow. And I thought about that because how can you make a statement about a person like, like, like really you know that person well? You know, to say that person was a vulgar person. You didn't miss anything. And, and I wonder how well do you know that person to make that statement. You see, God sees things you cannot see. Because we see what is in front of us, but God sees what? God sees the heart of a person. And sometimes we see somebody acting in a certain way, and we make a profile of that person. We make an assumption. She's rude. He's vulgar. He's irresponsible. She's this. He's that. Based on something that we saw that is limited because we're human beings, we're not God. God sees things that you cannot see. God sees everything. So your plans are limited because you can only see certain things. In fact, sometimes we can only see ourselves. We're going to spend a little bit on, on that. But God sees the whole picture. You see, God sees the past, the present, and the future. And God sees everybody. God sees the universe. You and I cannot see that. Hence, God's plans are better. God is in control of every detail of your life. Do you believe that? Is God in control of every detail of your life? What do you think? Is God in control? Or does he lose control? What do people do when they lose control? Can you see God doing that? <gasps> I was not waiting Mike to do that. I was not expecting Pop to do that. Can you, can you see God losing control? God is in control. His plans are better than yours. His plans are always fulfilled. You see, God had a, God had, God had a plan for Joseph. You remember Joseph in the Old Testament in Genesis? God had a plan, right? Since when he had a plan for Joseph? Since when? Yeah, since eternity, right? Now, did God at some point lose control of the plan for Joseph? When he was being arrogant as a little child? Because the way his dad was treating him and not the other brothers? Did God lose control? How about when he was almost murdered, when he was killed, you know, the intentions were there by his brothers, thrown in a pit. Did God lose control? Did God lose control? No, he didn't lose control. What you, God is in control. Did he lose control when he was sold as a slave? No. Did he lose control? Of, God, of Joseph's plan when he was thrown into prison? Did God lose control? No. And the evidence of that is when Joseph is the second of Pharaoh and his brothers are finally healed emotionally, spiritually. You know, and they're so sorry. Joseph says, it's okay because you guys meant it for evil. But God meant all this, everything that happened to me, for good. So God is in control of every detail of your life. Because God has a plan. God wants you to focus on what will last, not on things that are temporary. Okay? Things that are eternal. He wants you to focus on things that are eternal. What does it mean to focus? What does it mean to focus on something? You know, uh, I like baseball. 
I like the New York Mets. And there was a famous baseball pitcher. He died. His name was Tom Seaver. Have you heard of Tom Seaver? And Tom Seaver, thank you, Ravi. Tom Seaver is a Hall of Famer, you know. He's, he, 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 they, they call him Tom Terrific. They call him that franchise, you know. He was the best pitcher in Mets history. And when he was elected to the Hall of Fame, he was voted at that time with the most vote, 98%, you know, to the Hall of Fame. Like everybody knew this guy was good. He was really good. He was winning 20-plus games every season, you know. Uh, to tell you, if you win 15 games in a season, you're a good pitcher. This guy was winning 20-plus every year, every year. Uh, ERA is, a, is a, a statistic, you know. If you have a 3-plus, three 3-point-something three ERA, you're a good pitcher. This guy, his ERA for his career was 2-point-something, 2.8 or something for his career. So he was one of the best. And once they interview him and they say, Tom, why, why are you so good? Why are you so good at pitching? And this was his answer. He said, he says, because I'm a pitcher, everything in my life revolves around I'm a pitcher. What does that mean? They ask him. And he said, that means when I eat, I eat like a pitcher. Okay? I don't overeat. I don't eat things that are bad. I eat like a pitcher. He says, when I rest, I rest like a pitcher. Okay? He says, when I am in the off season, you see, in the winter, he says, I vacation like a pitcher. You understand? He didn't go on drinking and overeating because it was the off season. Because he says, because I'm a pitcher, everything in his life revolve around him being a pitcher. That is focus, my friends. See, as Christians, we ought to be focused. This is what the Bible says when it says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it what? That's focus, my friends. That's focus. That's not like, I don't feel like it. I'm on vacation right now. It's too cold. It's too hot. There's too many people. There are not enough people. That's focus. God's plan is not always easy. People think that if you said, okay, I want God's plan in my life, then life will be easy. God's plans are not always easy. Uh, last week, we reviewed the, study, the, 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 the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, you know. And this story tells us, for example, that God's plan for Mary, it was not an easy thing. You know what Mary's plans were before she got pregnant? Well, before she received the visit from the angel. You know what her plans were? She wanted to get married. She wanted to get married. This teenager wanted to get married. She had a boyfriend. She had a, 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 a groom. A groom? Yes? Okay. And, and, and she's planning to get married. She wants to get married. She wants to live in a house. She wants to have children. And then God come with God's plan. And he said, Mary, you're going to be pregnant. And not from Joseph. The Holy Spirit will take possession of you. You're going to become pregnant. By the way, before you get married. Okay, can you imagine Mary's plans? Mary's perfect plan. What happened to Mary's plans? Do, do, do you understand? Now she's pregnant, out of wedlock, not of the husband that she, you know, not of Joseph. And, and, and so God's plans, they come and they disturb. They, they, they make it very uncomfortable for Mary. What about Joseph? You know what Joseph's plans were? Apparently, this was his second marriage. Some scholars said he might be a widower, you know. But he, he's planning, I'm going to get married with this nice girl. You know, she's, she's, she fears the Lord. She fears God. We're going to start a new family. Everything is going to be okay. We're going to be blessed. 
Then the angel appears to Joseph and says, your girlfriend is pregnant. Not will be pregnant. She's pregnant already. Can you imagine Joseph's reaction? What? Don't worry, Joseph. It's from God. She's going to have a baby. And you remember Joseph's reaction, right? What does he want to do? Quietly, he wants to what? Leave her. He doesn't want any trouble. By the way, Mary was supposed to be stoned because of this. She was supposed to be killed because of this. You, you think God's plans for your life are easy? Everybody is out to praise you and, and say, oh, how good. You know, you, you fear the Lord. Uh, they, God's plans meant Mary was supposed to be murdered, was supposed to be killed. How about the wise men? Remember I told you last week? How far they had to travel? Probably, I don't know, in camels back. They have to travel. And they have to be interrogated by the king. And they have to travel six more miles from Jerusalem to the place. They, and they bring this gift. How about the shepherds? That night, it was peaceful. You know, they're out there enjoying Enjoying the good weather, not this kind of weather, the good weather. And, and, and angels appear, and you know, and there's good news, and there's peace for humanity. And, and, and now they have to go and worship, and then they have to tell everybody. And nobody believes shepherds because shepherds were not people that you trust, you know. It was not a good uh, occupation. They had a bad reputation. Now they, they got to tell people that the king was born. How about the innkeeper? Remember the innkeeper? You think he had it good? Now he has his family. There's no room. And, and he has to send them to where the animals are. And then this guy is going to be famous because he gave no room to the king. And he gave them the animal, the stable. God's plans are not always easy. God's plans are not always easy. And so if we know this, then we should not complain about God's plans. We should not complain. You know what is the opposite of complaining? Gratitude. Very good. It's gratitude. Gratitude is the opposite of complaining. Complaining is why does this always happen to me? Gratitude is what? I'm glad I'm still alive. Right? Gratitude is, I'm glad I'm still here. I'm glad I still have a roof over my head. I'm glad I still have food every day. Three times a day for some of you, right? Or more. Gratitude is saying thank you. The opposite of gratitude is complaining. If you're complaining, you're not gr grateful. You're, you, you don't, you, you're not saying thank you. If you say thank you, you don't have time to complain. You know, uh, I'm, I'm glad they're not here. I, I don't know if they're watching, but I'm glad they're not here because I, I think I will put them in the spot. You know Wanda, right? Wanda and Rolly. You know Wanda and Rolly, right? You know, you know Wanda does something very interesting. Uh, she, she helps with the food bank. Food bank, the soup kitchen. Yeah, okay, the soup kitchen. And, you know, for those of us that have been there, serving food to homeless is not, is not that glamorous, you know? You've been there, right? Sometimes they, 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 they don't, they're not, they don't have gratitude. You know, sometimes, some of them, not all of them, sometimes they, they demand their food, you know? And, and they get mad if you know, don't, don't give them more. And so it's not a glamorous thing. Ministry. You know that they're glamorous ministry. Do you know that? Do you know that? I told you my experience. When I was a young man, I always wanted to be uh, the Sabbath school superintendent. I wanted to be an elder. I didn't even wanted to be a deacon. Because you know what deacons did? This is what deacons do. They carry chairs. 
You know, they come and move the pulpit. They, 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 they do these things. They do this thing. This is what deacons do. That's not glamorous. You know, like people don't say, oh, look at the deacon. He's carrying the bench, right? And so we pick and choose where we want to serve. By the way, so what I wanted to say about Wanda and Rolly is they never complain, you know. They, they, they do their work in, in and out, you know. They do their work. You know, this church has a lot of needs. Do you know that? You know, we, we don't have an adventure club right now. You know why we don't have an adventure club? Do you know what? Part of the reason for me is that the parents of children on Adventures Club, they don't want to be there in the club. They want to bring their children to whoever is in charge. See you later. Take care of my children. And I told them, Adventures Club is not a daycare center. Like, you want, you, you need to participate. You need to be there. And if you don't want to do that, well, then we don't have a club. That's fine. You know another need that we have? Children's ministry. You want to work in this church? Listen, children's ministry during Sabbath school, we don't have people. We don't have people there. But it's not glamorous. It's not fancy because you're not up front here, right? They don't see you on the internet when you're, you understand, when you're in the, one of those rooms. Nobody sees you. So who wants to do that job? Nobody wants to do that because that's not a glamorous ministry. But there is a need. And, 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 and I told the person in church, listen, if you don't have parents that are willing to do that, then close it. Don't have it. What are we going to do? If you, the other parents, are not interested in your children, why would somebody else be interested? Shana. Raise your hand. Shana. Shana. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Go like that. You know Shana, right? You know Shana needs a ride every Sabbath to this church? That's a ministry right there. You know Brother Walter? He needs a ride every Sabbath to this church. But that's not glamorous. <laughs> you understand? Like, like you're not up front here because you gave a ride. You understand? In fact, you can be late because you gave a ride. You understand? And it could be difficult because, because of his hearing problem. Then you don't know how to ring the bell. And the only person that knows how to do that is Sister Jane. So if you want to help, you got to talk to Sister Jane. She'll tell you how. But, but these, these two individuals, these two members of our family, they need right to the church every Sabbath. Where, where are the volunteers for that ministry? Where are the people complaining, oh, I, I don't get a chance to ministry? There it is. But that's not glamorous. That's not fancy. You understand? I, I always remember in the New Testament it says that there was this man begging in the temple every, every, every what? Every day he was begging in the temple. Everybody that went to the temple could not take care of these men. They came to worship God, but there's a guy begging on the temple every day. Who took care of him? I remember in a church they told me, oh, brother, brother Francisco over there, brother Francisco, yes, 80 years old. Oh, yeah. But don't worry, pastor, he doesn't know how to read or write. He just comes to church. And I said, how long has he been, has he been at Seventh-day Adventist? 30 years. And nobody, nobody, nobody thought about teaching him how to read and write? He's been at Seventh-day Adventist for 30 years? Pastor Daquila, can you imagine that? 30 years, he comes in every Sabbath. He's sitting in a corner. But nobody thought, let me teach him how to write and read. Do you know why? It's not fancy. It's not glamorous. It's not being here. You understand? There's always ministry in the church to do. There's always something to do in the church. Always. But God's plans, they're not always easy. They're difficult. What are your resolutions for this year? You see, most of the resolutions have to do with self-development. You know what self-development is, right? I want to lose weight. I want to be healthy, right? 
I want to be good with my finances. Now, are those good things? Of course they're good things. I'm not saying they're bad things. But they all have to do with what? Self-development. You understand? What Jesus talks about in his gospel is self-denying. See the difference? We naturally want to develop ourselves. We naturally want to save ourselves. Do you understand what naturally means? It means there's no effort required. We do it naturally, normally. Since we were children, we were taught, we learned to take care of ourselves. Jesus comes alone and says, listen, my dad, my father, he takes care of you. You, in turn, have to take care of others. That's what Jesus teaches in the, listen, if you come on Wednesday, by the way, this Wednesday we're starting again. If you come on Wednesday, we're starting Matthew. Those are the principles of the kingdom, right? Principles of the kingdom are you take care of others. Yeah, but what about myself? Who's going to take care of me? Jesus says, my father. My father will take care of you. No, 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 but you don't understand Jesus. I need this and this. And Jesus says, my father knows what you need. And he will take care of you. So why are we always making plans for self-development? What kind of plans do you have for 2022? Are they, are they about yourself? Or are they about others? Are they about yourself or are they about others? See, you know, we live in an age where everybody has a camera today in their pocket, right? The cell phone. Everybody has a camera. You remember it used to be weird when somebody had a camera in church? Now everybody has a camera, right? And some of you are good photographers. Some of us are not. But if I were to take a selfie today, you know, let's say I got a big, nice camera, you know, I don't know how many pixels, whatever. Good camera. And I take a, a selfie and I say, I will put it on Facebook. And you have Facebook and you go to see that picture. Who is the first person you want to see? Who? Right? You never go to the picture to see, let me see how Brother G came. No, let me see how I came out. Correct? Because we do that what? Naturally. Right? Naturally, we're always thinking what? About ourselves. About us. But us, it's natural. It's very natural to take care of ourselves. The gospel of Jesus Christ is confronting us and saying, stop thinking about yourself. Start thinking about others. But you're saying, wait a minute, Pastor. No, 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 no. Don't take that to the extreme because we ought to take care of ourselves. Well, and Jesus says that his father takes care of us. But, you know, when you take care of, our, of yourself or myself, when I, I, I like to talk about boundaries. I like to teach people how to say no. That's taking care about yourself. But it's not taking care about yourself for the sake of you. It's taking care about yourself for the sake of serving better, you know, for the sake of serving others better. You know, bro, uh, Pastor Daquila, Pastor Ian, you, I don't know, maybe you can relate to this. But I have people say to me, uh, your sermons are too short. And other people say, your sermons are too long. And other people say, your sermons are not Seventh-day Adventists enough. Have, do you ever have that? Oh, I'm not the only. Do you ever have that? I'm not the only one then. Have you had that? Then you're not the, I'm not the only one, right? And, and you know what I tell people? I say, I don't care. And they, th they, they think that's offensive, you know. How can you not care? How can you not care? And you know what I said? I cannot afford to care. See, if I care about that, I'm going to get sick. You understand? And then I'm not going to be a good pastor to you. Do, do you understand? Taking care of yourself is for the sake of serving others better. Yes? God is always talking, listen, if you don't believe what I'm saying, look at this. The desire of ages. Pay attention to this passage. It's magnificent. It's also in the steps of Christ. But this, I took it from the desire of ages. It says, even now, you know, she's talking about even after sin. We live in a sinful world. She says, even now, all created things 
Declare the glory of his excellence. Now, pay attention to the word glory. We like to talk about the glory of God, the glory of God. Manifest your glory, Lord. Or let me, let me, let me show your glory. L listen, she's going to expand. She's going to make an ex exegesis on, on, the, on the glory of God. What does it mean, the glory of God? She says, even now all created things declare the glory of his excellence. There is nothing save the selfish heart of men except human beings that lives unto itself. See, live into yourself, taking care of yourself, self-development, taking care of yourself. Who's going to take care of me? No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves up on the ground, but ministers to some other life. I like the word ministers. Who's a minister? Who's a minister? The one that ministry, right? So everyone has a ministry. And your ministry, I mentioned it last Sabbath, is your workplace. Wherever you work, that's your ministry place. If you go to school, then the school is your ministry place. If you don't go to school, then it's your neighborhood. It's your home first and foremost. That's your ministry place, your wife, your children. But don't stay there. That's just the beginning. You need to expand your ministry. So everything that God created, no bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves up on the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass, but has its ministry. You understand? You have a ministry. Don't ever complain that the church is not giving you an opportunity to minister. Because every individual, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a ministry, my friend. Amen? Even tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which Neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal in turn minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers. What do they do? They what? What do they do? So no, no comments on 2022? No reading on 2022? What do they do? What did they do, Aiden? They, thank you. They breathe. What do they breathe? Fragrance and unfold their beauty and blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean itself, the source of all our springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land, but takes to what? Takes to give. Takes to give. It's not self-development. It's not taking care of myself for the sake of myself. It's you take to what? To give. The mist ascending from its bosom fall in showers to water the earth that it may bring forth. And what? But the angels of glory. Look at the angels. What did they do? The angels of glory find their joy in what? You know why you're not joyful? You know why there's no joy in your life? You know why there's no joy in my life? I'm not giving. If I'm not giving, I don't have joy. How was last year? <laughs> last year was miserable. <laughs> then you're not giving. Yes? They find their joy in giving. There is joy in giving. Giving love and tireless watch care to souls that are fallen and, unho fallen and unholy. Heavenly beings woo their heart. That's an interesting word, right? Woo, right? They woo the hearts of men. They bring to this dark world light from the courts above. By gentle and patient ministry, they move upon the human spirit to bring the lost into a fellowship with Christ, which is even closer than they themselves can know. And that's amazing. The angels cannot have that intimacy that we human beings, that we sinners can have with God through Jesus Christ. But turning from all lesser representations, she was giving examples of nature, but turning from all lesser representations, we behold God in Jesus. 
Study the life of Jesus. Study the gospel. Looking unto Jesus, we see that it is the glory of our God to do what? You see, the glory of God is not a bright light. Oh, the glory of God. Oh, I cannot see it. No. The glory of God is to give. Are you seeing this? I do nothing of myself, says Christ. The living Father has set me, and I live by the Father. I seek not my own glory, but the glory of him that sent me. In these words, watch what she says. In these words, is set forth the great principle, which is the law of life for the universe. Some of you like to talk about the law of God, right? The law, the law, the law. This is the law of the universe. And many of us are breaking that law. Right? Because we're not what? We're not giving. That's right. We're not giving. That's the law of life of the universe. I will dare to say, I will suggest, that's the plan of God for your life. You were created to give. You were created to receive from God. And you were created to give what God has given you to others, to bless others. We are blessed to be a blessing. All things Christ received from God. But he took to give. Like the ocean, right? Take to give. So in the heavenly courts, in his ministry for all created beings, through the beloved son, the father's life flows out to whom? To Sabbath keepers? To only what those that give the tithe back? Only to vegetarians? To whom? To all human beings. God gives to all. God gives to all. To all. To drug addicts, to alcoholics, to murderers, to thieves. God gives. Through the Son it returns in praise and joyous service. A tide of love to the great source of all. And those through Christ, the circuit of beneficency. I hope I said that word right. Beneficence. Is complete. Representing the character of the great giver, the law of life. That is God's plan for you. Not only for 2022, but for your life here on earth. Luke 14, 25 says. And there went great multitudes with him. Do you know that Jesus was always surrounded by great multitudes? Do you know that? You see, we read this. A scholar said, a commentator said, but we don't smell the people. You see, when we say great multitudes follow Jesus, we don't smell the people. Have you been around, well, not in the last two years, right? But have you been around a lot of people, close to a lot of people? In those years... In those times, they didn't shower every day. It was not possible. You understand? The roads had dust. So people what? People smell. And this great multitude was always following Jesus. More than that, you know, these people had, a, they had some conditions. Most of them were what? They were sick. And you know what they wanted to do with Jesus? What did they want to do with Jesus? Eh? Touch him. So, so think of about these movies. Uh, you know, people that are sick want to touch you, right? He's like, hey, you, know, you understand? And wherever he went, those people went with him. Wherever he went. That's why in the New Testament you find Jesus went usually to a lake, you know, to the sea. Because it seems that that was the only way that he could get on a boat and what? And get, be away from the people. Because all these people, smelly people, people complaining, people with diseases, they wanted to touch Jesus, they wanted to be around Jesus. Do you like to be around people? Like that? <laughs> Do you like to be around people like that? Even Jesus sometimes said, listen, I, I, need, I need to. You know, you know Jesus said that sometimes? 
We, we need to be. Some, some of us think we're greater than Jesus. Pastor, you have always, you, you always have to be available. I, I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not Jesus. I'm telling you that. So, so Jesus sees his people. They're following him. And then he turns. He turns around. And watch this. He turns to the people that are following him. And he says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren, and sisters, he and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. Does that sound nice? How does that sound? See, the people are following him. The people are following him, wherever he goes. And then he turns to them and says, oh, you that are following me, if you don't hate your father, your mother, your sister, your children, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Well, the first thing is, he's not talking about the feeling of hate. I hate, you know, like a teenager will say to his dad, right? To her dad. I hate you, dad. I hate you, mom. No, no, it's not that. And he's not hate his own life, you know, like some people say, I hate my life. I want to kill myself. It's not that. How do we know? Well, because Jesus doesn't contradict himself. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, and go back to Matthew again, right? And he says that if you only think of hate towards somebody, what is that considered? What did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? If you, if, you, if you only think of hating somebody, what is that? You understand? So Jesus is not saying hate your father in that sense. What is he talking about? He's talking about putting somebody else at the center of your life. Putting the focus of your life around your, fa your parents or your children or your wife or your husband or your siblings. You, you know we do that? If my wife leaves me, I'm dead. If my husband leaves me, I die. No, you won't die. No. He and she is not the source of life. The source of life is Jesus Christ. If my children... No, no, no. no, you will not die. The children are not the source of your life. If my family... No, your family is not the source of life. No, it's Jesus Christ the source of life. Amen? But then Jesus says, but if you focus on yourself, that is... If you, if you focus on yourself, self-development, I need, I need this, I need that, I need that. Then Jesus says, then you cannot be my disciple. Then who has to be the center of my life? According to Jesus, he says, I am at, I'm out to be the center of your life. And if I am the center of your life, guess what? Then you are equipped to bless others. To bless your wife, to bless your husband, to bless your children. I find it very interesting when people say, my wife is my universe. My husband is my universe. Others say, my children are my universe. Meaning they care a lot about them. And then I said, but if you don't have God in your heart, you have nothing to give them. So you're lying. You're a liar. They're not really the center. Because if God is not the center of your life, you have nothing to give. A house, a car, a career, all of that will disappear. You know that, right? All of those things are not eternal. The only thing that is eternal is Jesus Christ. That's everlasting. You know, we naturally are drawn to self-preservation, to save ourselves. You, you know that <clears throat> I said that you should never talk about vaccines from this pulpit. Remember? I've said that to a lot of preachers. So I'm going to talk about vaccine today because I'm going to talk about both groups. People that get vaccinated, they never get vaccinated because of others. People get vaccinated because of them. Right? 
And people that do not get vaccinated, they never, they don't get the vaccine because of others. They don't get vaccinated because of them. So on both ends, the motive is what? Self. That's why that discussion is nonsense. I don't want to talk about that because it's all egocentric and it goes against the gospel. And when he had called the people unto him, that's all I'm going to say about vaccine, by the way. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him what? Let him deny himself and take up his cross and what? And follow me. For, so, for whosoever will save his life shall what? Lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, see Jesus said, for my sake, and the gospels, the, sh the same shall what? You understand what Jesus is saying here? Do you understand this? He says that if you live for yourself, you will have nothing to show up for. But if you live for others, you will have eternal life. Not as a result of serving others. As the result of the love of Jesus Christ in your heart. Now, what is the only way to, to live a life that is according to the plan of God? And the plan of God is to save humanity. The plan of God is greater. You know, yeah, sure, the plan of God made things difficult for Mary. But Mary's son was going to bring blessing to the whole world, to the whole universe. How do you know if you're living according to God's plan? 1 Corinthians 13. You know, we use 1 Corinthians 13 on weddings, but we never read this. Suppose I, suppose I speak in the languages of human beings. You know, before that he was talking about gifting. You know, some people having abilities and gifting according to your personality, whatever. And so Paul says, let's suppose... You know, let, let, let's, let's pretend that I, I have the ability to speak many different languages. You know, Portuguese, English, Tagalog, Spanish, French. Let's suppose I'm able to speak in all those languages. And, the, and then he says, let's go further. Let's suppose I'm able to speak in the language of angels. What is the, the, the language of angels? Of course, it's Spanish, yeah. But we don't know, you know, we don't know if, I, I think if you would have asked Paul, Paul wouldn't know either. But Paul is saying, I'm just giving you an illustration. I'm giving you an illustration. Paul says, if there was an, a, a, a language that only angels spoke, and let's suppose, Paul says, that I'm able to understand that language, that I'm able to speak that language. Let's suppose I'm able to speak that language. Then he says, if I don't have love, if I don't have love, I'm only what? I'm only, a, a, I'm only this. You know what this is? Huh? What is this? No, it's not only noise. It's more than that. What is this? It's annoying. Right? Many people that have no love and they do all religion things, they're annoying. That's, all the, that's what Paul is saying. You're, you're just a noise. Oh, they don't like me. Because you're annoying. That's why they don't like you. Because you're like this. Right? You're going to hell. If you don't keep the Sabbath, you're going to hell. People, people get annoyed by that. Suppose I have the gift of prophecy. Oh, well, now he's getting Adventist here. Suppose I have the gift of prophecy. I can understand prophecy. I can tell you what is going to happen in 22. 22? 2022. Right? Let's suppose in prophecy I can tell you the downfall of the economic, the, econo the world economics. Right? And then he says, suppose I can understand all the secret things, the mysteries of God. Oh, now he's getting very Adventist. 
You know that we, you, you see, there's the Catholic Church, right? And out of the Catholic Church came Protestantism, right? But Protestants still, they still remain with things from Catholicism. You know that? And then out of Protestants, Protestantism came what? Adventists. But you know that Adventists stay with things from Protestants too? Do you know that? And from Catholics too. Do you know that? So there are many people that get baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist church, but they're still Protestants and they're still Catholics. Yeah. There are many. I see them all the time. They're Adventists, but they're still Evangelicals. They're still Catholics. Because their heart has not been changed. Their heart has not been transformed by Jesus Christ. Those people, they like to make points. They like to make points. Sunday is not the rest of the day. It's Sabbath. You see, what are they doing? They're making a point, right? Right? The Ten Commandments. Yeah, they're making a point. Jesus will come visibly. Everybody will see it. They're making a point. Yes? Dead people are not in heaven. Dead people are sleeping. They're making a point. They like to make point. But they don't make a difference. They don't make a difference. They make points, but they don't make differences. You know why Jesus was killed? Jesus was not killed for making points. Bear with me. Jesus said, I am the son of God. I am God. Is that why they kill him? Is that why they kill him? That's no reason to kill somebody. You think Jesus was the only one, the first one to say that he was God? No, there were many crazy people that have said that before Jesus and after Jesus Christ. Even today, there are people that say they're God. How come we don't kill them? Because you don't kill people for making points. You kill people if they're making a difference. See, the problem was, you know, Jesus, 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 uh, I, I did many miracles. For which one of them do you want to kill me? Remember that? Oh, we don't want to kill you for the miracles. Also, miracles are not enough to kill you. We want to kill you because you being a human being are saying you're the son of God. But people have said that before. They knew people. They knew people that were saying that. What was different about Jesus? What was different about Jesus? Why Jesus was not just a crazy crazy guy, ah, don't pay attention to him. Why? What was different about Jesus? What's the difference? Yes, he was changing life. People were going after him. People were able to see his eyes and they saw love in him. Are you with me? They saw his eyes and they saw love in Jesus Christ. Many Adventists are worried because of the persecution. They're not going to persecute you. Don't worry. I already know. They're not going to persecute you. Because if you're not making a difference, they're not going to persecute you. If you're making a difference in the life of people, then they're going to persecute you. That's how it works. They don't persecute you because you say, I'm the son of God. Then they will say, you're crazy. You're not the son of God because you're not acting like the son of God. There are ministries in this church that need people. Suppose I have the gift of prophecy. Suppose I can understand all the secret things of God and know everything about him. That's making points. And suppose I have enough faith to move mountains. Isn't that the purpose of religion, to have enough faith to move mountains? Isn't that the purpose? What would you say about me if I move a mountain because of faith? What would you say about me? You will say that I have what? Power and faith. And, Je and, and Paul says, well, that's nothing. By the way, do you know that people are capable of doing that without having love? Do you know that? This is what Jesus said. Jesus says, many will come on that day and, what, and they will tell me, didn't we in your name what? Move mountains. So to, do, to perform miracles is possible without love. But then Jesus will say, but I don't know you, my friend. 
Because God can do miracles through a donkey. That's not offensive. That's biblical. God made a donkey talk. If I don't have love, I am nothing at all. Suppose I give everything I have to the poor people. <gasps> Can you imagine? You remember the rich young man? The rich young man goes to Jesus. What should I do? What Jesus says. Go and sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. And then what? Do you know that every time we preach. Have you preached a sermon? Have you preached from that passage? You know that every time we preach from that passage, we never expect somebody from the congregation to get up, go and sell everything, and on Sunday give it to everybody. We don't expect that, right? Why? Why? Huh? No, even if I do it, I don't expect you to do it because I do it. In fact, Jesus is not expecting you to do it either. He was expecting that from the rich young men. Because God... Relates to each one of us in different manners, but he expects the same thing from all of us, which is everything. What is everything for you? What is everything for me? It's not the same as the rich young men, right? But Paul says, let's suppose I sell everything and give it to the poor. Wouldn't you say that, that's, that's worth it of praise? Wouldn't you say that's a, a man of God? Wouldn't you say that? And then Paul goes to the extreme. You know, he's using hyperbole. hyperbole? He says, suppose I give myself over to a difficult life. So I can, you, you know what he's saying? After I sold everything, there is nothing. Now, suppose I sell myself as a slave. Suppose I, I sell myself as a slave. And the money they give me for that, I still give it to the poor. So can you imagine? Paul says, suppose I do that. If I don't have love, what? So, my friends, let's finish this. Okay. So, God wants him, you to have him at, at the center of your life. The most important thing. Number one in your life. Now, what's the evidence you have God as the center of your life? What is the evidence? Eh? No, there are a lot of people that are alive and don't have God as the center of their life. What is the evidence that you have God at the center of your life? Huh? You have love. And what is the evidence you have love? What is the evidence you got love? For whom? For whom? For others, not for myself. Yes? God at the center of my life. How do I know? I have love. But if I am still thinking about me, 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 and me, and me, and me, comma, me. You still have no love. At least not the love that God is talking about, the one that Jesus is talking about. It's when you empty yourself and you start serving others. That's what you were created for. That's the plan of God for every human being, to share the love of God with others. Nature is an example of that. So, my friends, before I pray, Anybody would like to do that today? Make that commitment. I want to put God at the center of my life. I want to make resolutions that are designed to help others. I want to live to serve others. I don't want to complain in this year. I want to be grateful this year. I want to live with an attitude of gratitude. Is there anyone? Anyone? Can you stand up? Can you stand up if you want to do that? Only if you want to. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. Don't, don't worry. Only if you want to do it. Let's pray. Father in heaven. Here we are again, Lord. This is not new. This is not a revolution. This, Lord, here we are again. We're about to start another year. And you've been patiently waiting for us. You have not forgotten you, you didn't forget that you have to return. You, you want to return, but you don't want us to perish. And Lord, if we don't put you at the center of our life, we're fooling ourselves. 
I mean, we can follow you like that multitude was following Jesus. We, we can be travel companions, but we cannot be disciples of Jesus Christ. We cannot be disciples if we don't put Jesus at the center of our life. And so, Lord, once again, we come before you. Take our heart. Take our, take our mind. Take our, our desires. Take possession of our hearts, Lord. That's the only way I can be a good husband. That's the only way I can be a good wife. That's the only way I can be a good son, a good daughter, a good brother, a good sister, a good neighbor. That's the only way I can be a good missionary. Lord, I want you to be the center of our life. You, number one, you, priority. We want to be like you, Lord. You are love. You give. We want to be like you. You want us to be like you. So look at the sincerity of our heart. Look at our desires. And please, Lord, perform a miracle in our life. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.